chapter number one today, Hebrews chapter number one. I try to go there at least once a year. Hebrews chapter number one, the first four verses. Uh, it's Christmas time. Thank God for this joyous season. And it just seems like hearts are sweeter. People are more timid. Opportunities given to give out the gospel even more and more. We should be that way every day. Uh, but here we talk about Christ. We think about gifts. And we think about the greatest gift given, the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Now there's one song we sing at Christmas time. And it asks the question, what child is this? You know that song, what child is this who's laid to rest and so on. Well, the chorus answered, this, this is Christ the King, the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you really know who the Lord Jesus Christ is? Do you know what the Bible has to say concerning the Lord Jesus Christ, who he is? Now, the Bible says over in the book of um, uh, Matthew chapter number 22 and verse number 42, it says, whose son is he? Speaking of Christ, in Matthew chapter number 16 and verse number 13, it says... Whom do men say I, the Son of Man, am? So that question is still asked today. And then in Luke chapter number 8, verse number 25, it says, You remember what manner of man is this? Remember he got up, he commandeth even the winds and the water, and they obey him. I wonder how many people are still asking this same question. What child is this? Well, you can never answer that question and do you have the full record unfolded in the gospel accounts and that is, of course, his birth that we focus on this time of the year. Not only his birth, but his coming of age in Nazareth, his baptism by John, his goings forth into Galilee and Judea with his disciples, his miracles, his last week in Jerusalem that culminated in the crucifixion, the cross of Calvary, the blood that was shed, and thank God for his glorious resurrection. And then it was still not over uh, there was a moment in Jerusalem when the Spirit of God was poured out on the waiting disciples. The whole city was gathered together to hear the great sound of a mighty rushing wind in the wonder of Pentecost as recorded there in Acts chapter number 2. And it is only then you begin to get a full answer to the question of what child is this? Well, we go to Hebrews chapter number 1. Are you there? Hebrews chapter number 1. And these verses, the first four verses will answer the question of who the Lord Jesus Christ is. The Bible says in verse number 1 of Hebrews chapter number 1, God who at sundry times and in divers manners spake in times past unto the fathers by the prophets, hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom he, all, he made, he also, by whom also he made the worlds, who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high, being made so much better than the angels as he hath by inheritance obtained a more excellent name than they. Now in the declaration of this passage is that God spoke God spoke in times past. He spoke unto us by his prophets, according to Hebrews chapter number 1 and verse number 1. But now, in verse number 2, hath spoken unto us by his Son. Now, this babe lying in a manger wrapped in swaddling clothes, as presented in Luke chapter number 2, is the ultimate, complete word of God to mankind. For 2,000 years, God has not given any new revelation. All that God wants, uh, uh, wants to say has been said already, and it's up to us to hear and to heed what he says. Now, Brother Dewey was bringing that out in 1 Corinthians chapter number 14. The Bible says in Revelation chapter 22 that not to add anything to this wonderful revelation and don't take away from this wonderful revelation. If we do, then the Bible said all the plagues would be added to you. And then if you took anything or added anything or if you took anything out, then your name would be taken out of the book of life. And only lost people have their names removed from the book of life. So there is no new revelation. Everything that God wants us to hear, everything God wanted to say has already been said and we have it right here in front of us. Amen. In this wonderful King James Bible that we have today. 
Now, uh, it's up to us to hear and to heed what he says. The Bible tells us in the book of Mark, chapter number 4, in verse number 24, that we should take heed what we hear. What we hear. We don't let our hearts get trampled on with hearing all sorts of false doctrine. Did you know the more that we hear, the more confused we get in that respect? In that respect. I've had people come to me and want to know truth and they'll say, would you just open the Bible and show me some truth? I said, well, tell me what, tell me what you want to know and they'll begin to get off on some tangent. And we have even people here this morning that was involved in Jehovah Witness. Some was involved in the Mormon religion. We have some involved in Armstrong and so forth. And their heart has been trampled so much their heart has become hardened and it was difficult for them to accept truth. Did you know what the Bible says? The Bible said, take heed what you hear. You need to make up your mind that you're going to open this Bible and if God says it, I'm going to believe it. Yep. Stay in the Word of God. Don't get outside the boundaries of the Word of God. And then the Bible says in Luke chapter number 8 and verse number 18, take heed how you hear. How you hear. Listen with an open heart. I'm asking you today to listen with an open heart. Follow along. You have your Bible in front of you. You should have your Bible in front of you. You follow along with what we read and what we say. And you check out everything that's said from behind this pulpit with the wonderful, wonderful Word of God. So take heed what you hear and take heed how you hear. Now that's... Um, and then of course we have the complete Word of God, the Bible said, uh, according to Hebrews chapter number 1 and verse number 2. And that's why for 21 centuries we have not had an event like Christmas. John, the, 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 the Apostle John, begins his gospel on the same note as Hebrews chapter number 1. If you will, take your Bibles, go back to the gospel of John and chapter number 1. John chapter number 1. Listen, listen to what he has to say in the first three, three verses. The Bible says in John chapter number 1, beginning in verse number 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. And then if you'll go to verse number 14 of John chapter number 1, the Bible said, And the Word was made flesh, and we beheld His glory. The Word was made flesh and dwelled among us, and we beheld His glory, the glory as of the only begotten uh, of the Father, full of grace and truth. So we see the same note as Hebrews chapter 1 starts out with, so does John chapter number 1. The writer of Hebrews surrounds this statement that Jesus is the Word of God with certain phrases that give great reason while, uh, as to why the child at Bethlehem is God's final word to man. Now, first of all, Jesus outspeaks the prophets. God reaching down to men. In Hebrews chapter number 1 and verse number 1, God, who at sundry times and in divers manners spake in times past unto the fathers by the prophets. Now, an assumption is made that God is or God exists. A second assumption immediately follows that thought, and that is that God has spoken. God is, and God has spoken. There is no attempt to argue for the existence of God. The Bible never does this, but always takes it for granted. In Genesis chapter number 1, in verse number 1, in the beginning, God... God created the heavens and the earth. Nor is there any discussion as to the possibility or even likelihood of a divine revelation. This is also presupposed and implied. God has spoken. Revelation. However, the opposite of discovery, and it is God who hath revealed himself not man who has discovered God. 
Let me go a little further and say this. Religion is man's attempt to find the supernatural God. And he does it in several ways. Especially in today's society, he tries to find God by establishing his own righteousness according to Romans chapter 10, rather than receive or submit himself to the righteousness of God who is the Lord Jesus Christ. Religion, again, is man's attempt to find the supernatural God. Salvation is God's entry into human existence to reveal himself to mankind. Now, we're talking about religion is my reaching up to make contact with God. Salvation is God reaching down into man's existence, making contact with man. If God had never initiated salvation, there would be no salvation. And that's why we read constantly, consistently in Ephesians chapter number 2, verse number 8 and 9, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is a gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. There is nothing you can do to gain, whole, to gain an audience with a holy God, but what is necessary has already been done in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. Hebrews chapter number 1 and verse number 1, God has spoke, spoken in primarily two ways. First of all, God spoke through his prophets, yet that the Old Testament was not his final word. The Old Testament was written over a period of about 1,500 years with several different authors. Each one received bits and pieces of revelation, which is progressive revelation. That is a progressive unfolding of the truth of God. For instance, let me give you for instance, Moses in Genesis said that Christ would be of the seed of the woman. We find that first prophecy of a coming Messiah in Genesis chapter 3 and verse number 15. And then Isaiah said that he would be born of a virgin in Isaiah chapter number 7 and verse number 14. Micah said in chapter number 5 and verse number 2 that he would be born at Bethlehem. Isaiah chapter 53 said that he would be a suffering servant who would die for the sins of mankind. But there was more to be said. There was more to be said. And then, of course, Hebrews chapter 1, verse 2 said, In these last days he's spoken to us by his Son. Now, the Bible even says right here in the book of um, 1 Peter, 1 Peter chapter number 1, let me find it and read it for you. The Bible said in 1 Peter chapter number 1, verse number 10, of which salvation the prophets have inquired and searched diligently who prophesied of the grace that should come unto you. Searching what or what manner of time the Spirit of Christ which was in them did signify when it testified beforehand the sufferings of Christ and the glory that should follow. So the prophets were puzzled by the pieces that they examined. They couldn't get the total picture until God spoke his final word, his final word. And then, of course, his final word is the Lord Jesus Christ. Acts chapter number 10, verse number 43 says, To him give all the prophets witness. God's final word, Jesus. God's total word to man. If you'll notice in verse number 2, Jesus Christ is the heir of all things. The heir of all things. Verse number 2 of Hebrews chapter number 1, Hath in these last days spoken unto us by his Son, whom he hath appointed heir of all things, by whom also he made the worlds. Now God created Adam and Eve, gave them dominion over all things, when sin, that is the animals, of course, and the earth. But when sin entered, they lost that dominion, Satan was made the little g, God of this world. Did you know the Lord Jesus Christ, God became man, revealed Almighty God, His character, and God defeated Satan in the person of Christ when He rose again from the dead after being crucified for our sins. What the first Adam messed up, the second Adam fixed up, and you can go to heaven if you'll believe it. Amen? Now that's good news. That is wonderful news. Now... Uh, and then not only that, but according to Romans chapter number 8, verse number 17, the Bible said that we could be heirs with God and join heirs with Christ. That is a wonderful promise. Jesus Christ is not only God's final word to man, He's the heir of all things. He is a creator of all things. 
If you'll notice again in Hebrews chapter number 1, and we're answering the question, what child is this? He's the heir of all things. He's a creator of all things. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter number 1, in verse number 2, by whom also he made the worlds. By also whom he made the worlds. Hold your place in Hebrews, go to Colossians. Colossians chapter 1. Everyone following along, I, I trust you are. I'm going a little fast, I realize, this morning. But in Colossians chapter number 1, if you'll notice in verse 15 and 16 and 17. Colossians chapter 1, speaking of Christ who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature. I read this a lot and, and I have to stop after verse 15 and say that firstborn is position, not created in time. Yeah, I hope you know that. Hope you hope you get that. Who is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of every creature, for by him were all things created that are in heaven and that are in earth, visible and invisible whether they be thrones or dominions or principalities or powers, all things were created by Him and for Him. Now, if I stopped right there, I believe that would even be enough to show you who Christ is. What does Genesis 1-1 say? In the beginning, God created. Colossians chapter number 1, verse 16, all things were created by Him and for him. Verse number 10, for by him were all things created. He's a designer. In verse number 16, created by him, he's the builder, and for him, he's the owner. Verse 17, and he is before all things, and by him all things consist. Several years ago, a scientist said that the chance of intelligent life on earth coming about by a series of accidents is about 400,000 trillion to one. Now, he doesn't stop there. This is what he says. He said, what's incredible is that's how it happened. Amen. I think he's a French fry short of a Happy Amen. Meal. <laughs> Amen? Yes, I do. The Lord Jesus created. Why can't you just believe the Bible? Why well, just God created? Jesus is creator. Not only what child is this? He's heir of all things. The Bible makes it clear in, in Hebrews chapter number one, verse number two. He's a creator of all things. Not only that, he is the brightness of God's glory. He's the brightness of God's glory. Look at verse number three of Hebrews chapter one. Who being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. Now, if you want to know what God's like, then look at the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. If you want to know what God would say, then listen to the Lord Jesus Christ. Jesus is the brightness of God's glory. The Bible says in John chapter 14, verse number 1, Let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. Jesus is saying that I am equal with God. You remember the rich young ruler when he came to the Lord Jesus and he said, Good master. And you remember what the Lord told him? He said, Why callest thou me good. There is one good. Jesus was looking at this rich young ruler and saying, are you saying that I am God? My dear friend, before you ever get saved, you're going to realize what child is this we talk about every Christmas season. That little child in the manger. There was a time in my life years ago that I thought that Jesus came into existence in Bethlehem's manger. I didn't know that he was eternal. 
I didn't know that he was eternal. Then I went to a portion of scripture over in John chapter 4 and verse number 10 where it's, he told the woman at the well, he said, if you knew the gift of God and who it was and you would have asked, I would have given you the water of life freely. You know, the Lord Jesus said, you're going to know two things. You're going to know the gift and I am the gift. I'm eternal life. And you're going to know who. Who is he? I'm God. I'm God in the flesh. God incarnate. He is God. He always claimed to be deity. Never, never did he ever discredit his deity. Never did any of the prophets or any of the scripture discredit the deity of Christ. Jesus is God. And you're going to believe that, my dear friend, before you ever get saved. I promise you that. And so what child is this? Well, he's the heir of all things. He's the creator, the creator of all things. He is the brightness of God's glory. And then, number four, he's the express image of God. John chapter 14, I've already quoted that in verse number 9. He that hath seen me has seen the Father. Jesus is the very express image of Almighty God. He's creator. And if you'll notice <clears throat> there in verse number 3, the fifth thing, he upholds all things by the word of his power. The picture here is maintaining and sustaining. All, and we read it over in Colossians 1.17. By him all things consist. If Jesus ever took his hand away from this universe, it would come apart. It would blow up. Now, I read, now, I'm, I, I don't know, maybe you're familiar with that Stanford Linear Accelerator, two miles long. They call it an atom smasher. Well, anyway, they're finding particles that they can not even invent a name for. And somebody said, well, how's it all held together? And they said, some kind of cosmic glue. Why don't you just say the very hand of God holds this thing together? Amen. Amen. That's who holds it together. The, the Christ of the universe, our wonderful Messiah. Did you know the Bible says even over in Matthew chapter 28, verse number 18, all power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. If all power is given to Christ, why should you and I fear to do his bidding? Why should you and I fear to go into all the world and preach the gospel? Why should you and I fear to tell the whole world that that babe in the manger is God incarnate? Come to die for your sins and rise again for your justification. Now look here. Now number six, number six. He is the heir of all things. He's the creator of all things. He's the brightness of God's glory. He's the express image of God's person. He upholds all things, number five, by the word of his power. And then, number six, he himself, by himself, purged our sin. Did you notice right here the writer of the book of Hebrews? And we don't know who it is. We think it may be the Apostle Paul. But it doesn't matter. We know this for sure. The Holy Spirit wrote it. We know that for sure, so I can speak it boldly and unashamedly and not be embarrassed by its wording. Did you know the Bible says right here that uh, the, the writer moves from creation to Calvary? Now, from creation to Calvary, part of God's final word to us is that Jesus Christ purged our sins. Now think about that. Purge. Is that past, present, or future? Past. Past. So verse number three, <clears throat> the writer of Hebrews saying that our sins have been purged. Is that, is that what he's saying? Y'all have to shake your heads or act like you're awake or listening. Make me feel good and act like you're listening anyway. Look at Hebrews 9. Hebrews 9. Hebrews 9, you've got to see this. Hebrews chapter 9, verse number 26. For then must he often have suffered since the foundation of the world. In other words, if Christ's sacrifice and blood was not sufficient, he would have had to continually do it every year, just like the blood of bulls and goats back in the Old Testament. All right, now, verse 26. For then must he have often suffered since the foundation of the world. But now, once in the end of the world, hath he appeared to do what? Put away sin. And how did he put away sin? By the sacrifice of himself. He purged our sins by his blood on the cross of Calvary. 
if peace is made by the blood and reconciliation made by the blood of Christ, according to Colossians chapter number 1 and verse number 20, it's already been made. Your sins have been purged. He's not going to come back and do it again. Amen. It happened one time. Now here's the message. That here's a message that should be preached every time someone stands up. Is why don't you believe it? Why are you still trying to do something to gain audience with a holy God when it's already been accomplished? For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth on Him should not perish but have everlasting life. While you're in Hebrews, look at chapter 10. Look at verse 10. By the which will we are sanctified through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ. How many times? Once for all. Verse 12. But this man, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever set down on the right hand of God. If the work of redemption was not complete, Jesus could have never sat down. He didn't sit down because he was tired. He sat down because the work of redemption was finished. Finished. It is finished. Is what he said on the cross of Calvary. And then if you'll notice, and in Hebrews 1, 3 says the same thing. After he purged our sins, what did he do? Sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. And then if you'll notice in verse uh, 14 of Hebrews 10, for by one offering... He hath perfected forever them that are sanctified. Look at verse 17 and 18. And their sins and iniquities will I remember no more. Now where remission of these is, where remission of what is? Sins and iniquities. Where remission of these is, there is no more offering for sin. Why is there no more offering for sin? Once is enough. But people are trying to put him back on the cross. He's not going to be smitten Amen. twice. One time is sufficient. One time God saw the travail of his soul, Isaiah 53 verse 11, and was satisfied. God was satisfied with the work of redemption. He purged our sin and sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Thank God after his death, after his death three days later, he rose again. He rose again three days, three nights later. Mary Magdalene came to him. I'm going to go quickly. And he said, touch me not, uh, touch me not, for I've not yet ascended. And you, you, you know, I used to think about that. Well, the Bible put it in there for a reason. He, I've not yet ascended. And we know that there, according to Hebrews chapter number 9, that there is a tabernacle in the heavenlies. And the earthly tabernacle was made after that, that similitude, wasn't it? Was, was, was it and so Jesus took his blood and he put it on the mercy seat in the heavens. He wasn't afraid of it being rejected like the high priest of the order of Aaron was. No, there wasn't any rope tied to him. There wasn't any bells on him. He took the blood and he put it on the mercy seat. And, and I know that's true because 1 John chapter 2 and verse 2 says, And he, Christ, is a propitiation for our sins, and not for ours only, but also for the sins of the whole world. His blood is on the mercy seat, and because his blood is on the mercy seat today, we stand forgiven continually in Christ. Pretty simple, isn't it? All right, so he took his blood, he put it on the mercy seat, Acts chapter number 1 records that he walked around and showed himself alive how many days? 40 days. 40 days. And then the disciples was there on the Mount of Olives and then all of a sudden Jesus ascended. And what did the angel tell them? He said, don't marvel. He said, why, do you, why are you stand gazing? Why do you marvel? Why are you stand gazing? For in, in the manner he went, so in like manner he's coming back. Did you know the Lord's coming back? Amen. That's part of the gospel. I hate leaving that out when I preach the gospel. He's coming back. Thank God he's coming back. He's coming back. He's going to come back to catch away the church. And then he's coming back, my dear friend, according to Revelation chapter number 19 and Acts chapter number 1, he's going to come back and establish his supernatural kingdom. And you know who's coming back with him in Revelation 19? Amen.
Are you, are you a part of that crowd? Amen. Are you a part of that crowd? What child is this? Boy, Hebrews chapter 1 and the first four verses really shed a lot of light on who he is. Amen. Who is Jesus Christ? What child is this? We sing that song, but I wonder how much of the world that hums that song and sings that song, I wonder how much of the world really realizes what child he really is. He didn't stay the babe in Bethlehem. Again, I told you, I used to think that that's where he originated. But then I read in Genesis, he's a creator. I, I read where he was at the burning bush in Exodus 3. I, I read where he wrestled with Jacob in Genesis 32. I read where he was the fourth man in the fire in the book of Daniel. Jesus Christ was the unseen captain in the book of Joshua. Wow. This wonderful, great God that we serve, the Lord Jesus Christ. Do you know Him? Do you know Him as your Savior? Well, I guess the question would be, does He know you? According to Matthew 7. Remember He said, depart from me, ye workers of iniquity. I never... Does He know you? Let's stand to our feet, please. We'll be... Have an invitation. Brother Dana, you come. Mrs. King, you come. Jesus Christ, God's final word to mankind. Heavenly Father, thank you for the message. I pray, dear Lord, that it would sink into hearts and minds, Lord. It would be meditated upon, thought about, and received, especially to that person that's never, ever trusted Christ. May they do so before it's eternally too late. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.